Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this Safety and Health Magazine webinar, Is the World a Battlefield? You're in the right place. We're going to give our audience just a few minutes to get settled today, and we'll start the presentation in about a minute. Thank you. Hi, everyone. You're in the right place for the Safety and the Health Magazine webinar, Is the World a Battlefield? We are going to give everyone a, just a couple moments here to get settled and join us today. We'll start the presentation in just a minute. Thank you. Hello everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast, Is the World a Battlefield? Identifying, Preventing, and Responding to Workplace Violence at All Risk Levels, sponsored by Aveta. My name is Barry Botino, and I'm an Associate Editor here at Safety and Health. I'll be moderating today's event. We'd like to thank you all for joining us for this webinar. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to share with you all today. As a disclaimer, the views of today's speaker and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we'll conduct a Q&A with our speaker. If you have a question, just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, and press the Send button. You don't have to wait for the Q&A to begin to send your question. We welcome those questions at any time during today's event. After this presentation, you'll also be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, but I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. This webcast will be archived so you can access it after today's live event. And to view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, you can visit us online at safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events or you'll also receive a link in our post-event email. With that, let's introduce our presenter. With us today is Corey Worden, who serves as a safety advisor to the City of Houston Health Department. Corey is an experienced safety pro with more than 16 years under his belt, and he's the author of nine books about safety-related topics. Corey's work has been published by the American Society of Safety Professionals, the Association of Occupational Health Professionals in Healthcare, and the Institute for Safety and Health Management. In addition to receiving numerous military awards and medals, Corey was honored as part of the 2015 Rising Stars of Safety by the National Safety Council, and he was the 2020 recipient of the Houston Health Department's Excellence in Community Service Award. Again, we thank you all for tuning into this presentation, and Corey, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you. A good good uh, afternoon, I guess afternoon now here in Central. Um, thank you, I appreciate the invitation to be here today. As always, it's always great to speak with, with like-minded people. So as you can see here today, we're gonna be talking about workplace violence and all the different forms that it sometimes appears and what we can do about that. So the first thing I was gonna mention here is why we're talking about this. So I'm, I'm certain, you know, that if, if you're interested in this topic, you've probably noticed that there's been a unfortunate increase in these type of situations in the last decade. Definitely, um, definitely an increase in the, the reporting and communication of these incidents. And so as this has happened, you know, there's been a couple of things I've been thinking about is the first one, of course, is, you know, if we talk about something like run, hide, fight, you know, we find ourselves talking about, okay, well, if you can't run, can't evacuate, you can't find a place to hide, and you're going to get hurt, somebody's trying to hurt you, then, you know, then you go to fight, and we talk about, well, you know, find a makeshift weapon, and see if you can figure out a way to incapacitate the person so you can get away, and then, you know, in a, 
always someone will ask, well, what do you mean by makeshift weapon? And then I'll find myself saying, well, you know, you can grab the fire extinguisher and you can have to blind somebody and then hit them with it. Um, if they're trying to shoot you, then that's a way to get out of there. Um, and then I always catch myself and I go, you know, I'm a safety professional talking about hitting somebody with a fire extinguisher. And I think, well, that must be really dire circumstances to where we even have this conversation. And so the other thing, of course, is we have stop the bleed kits, you know, and then the question becomes, if we have a situation that requires more people to provide trauma related first aid, things like tourniquets, then we have EMS and the EMS has their medic bags, then that means the risk for these situations is just enormously high that we're having this conversation that we need to have tourniquets placed in buildings at the same frequency as AEDs and fire extinguishers. So then of course the question is, you know, when we're, we're having these conversations with, with everybody across the board now, not just people like soldiers. Hi folks, we're having a little bit of issue with Corey's video here. We will work with him just a moment here. Please, uh, be just a minute here. Let's. Uh, we're going to make contact with Corey here, offline, and see if he can restart his video. Uh, but we thank you for your patience. We'll be back with you in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your patience. It looks like Corey is restarting his uh, machine here and we'll get started in just a moment here. Thank you again, folks, for joining us today. As Corey reconnects here, we wanna do uh, jump back in and thank, for, thank you for being with us here. Looks like Corey just had a little technical glitch here and we thank you for your patience. And as Corey rejoins us here, we just want to let you know that we will have a Q&A at the end of this. So feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A button there at the bottom of your screen. And uh, just go ahead and press the send button and we'll grab those questions from you for our Q&A session. And it looks like Corey is just trying to reconnect here. Yes, I'm, I apologize for that. I All right, Corey, you're back with us. Um, Let's let, give Corey a moment here to share his screen again, folks, and we'll get restarted again. We thank you for your patience. And we'll let you know that also afterwards, we're gonna ask you to uh, share your thoughts on a um, evaluation survey that we'll have. This does help us to uh, improve our future webinars. Uh, we thank you for that as well. And we'll just get Corey restarted here and we'll get up and run it again. It'd be about 30 seconds. I'm okay. Great. Thank you for that, Corey. We appreciate it. Okay. We're grateful for you all hanging in there with us. Thank you so much for that. We appreciate your patience. And as soon as Corey is up and running again here, we'll get our screen shared again and we will uh, pick up where we left off there. Thank you, folks.
be just a moment here, folks. Thanks again for your patience as we get restarted here. Uh, Corey had a bit of a glitch there and got uh, bounced off his system, so we'll get him up and running again here in just a moment. Thank you very much for your patience. And as Corey gets reconnected here, folks, we will let you know that uh, we do have another webinar coming up on December 14th. Uh, it is Incident Investigations, Finding and Eliminating Root Causes. And you can go to our website, safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events to learn a little bit more about that event coming up on December 14th. Okay, we hear your sound, Corey. We're just ready whenever you're ready to share your screen. It should be coming up here momentarily. Okay, great. Thank you, Corey. Appreciate that. You know, sometimes when we lose our connection, that uh, restart process feels like it takes about five years. So thank you again, folks, for bearing with us here while we're uh, working out the technology bugs. We thank you for that. And folks, as we look ahead to 2022, we'd like to let you know our, our first webinar of 2022 is scheduled for January 13th. Uh, that one is titled OSHA Training for General Industry, Reviewing the Elements for Select Topics. And that will be January 13th. So we'd love to have you for that one as well. All right, looks like we lost Corey. He's probably restarting again here. I know he's having some issues with the restart. Um, so folks, we appreciate you bearing with us here again. Let me just run through, if you don't mind, folks, December 14th, we have a webinar coming up, Incident Investigations, Finding and Eliminating Root Causes. And also on January 13th, our very first webinar of the new year uh, will be OSHA Training for General Industry, Reviewing the Elements for Select Topics. And you can find both of those uh, webinars and Sign up for those. You can register now at safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. And it looks like we have Corey back with us again. Hello, Corey. And I see he's moving through his slides mm -hmm. here. Great. Folks, we appreciate your patience. Right. Thank you so much. And Corey, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, thank you. And I apologize for that. I, I wish I knew why the power just dropped on me. But um. So go ahead and pick it up where we left off. What we're talking about, of course, is workplace violence. And so what we were saying there is there's a number of these kind of situations that just seem so dire in scope that it has caused us to have these workplace violence prevention discussions at, at all levels of all workplaces and in all public areas. So some of the things that we're going to talk about are those different threats, different risk levels, different preventative strategies, response strategies, and then also how that relates to first aid and other components. So with that, a couple of facts that we'll talk about, of course, workplace violence is, you know, at the core, it's a workplace hazard. So if we're talking about this in terms of risk management, then it falls under risk control. So it should be included in our safety management systems. Uh, we also know that overall threats and also actual acts of violence have increased in varying degrees, especially in the last decade. And these range, of course, from verbal assault all the way to worst case scenarios. Uh, 
So there's a lot to be talked about there. And then of course, if we're talking about specifics like healthcare, then the frequency is gonna be much higher because we're talking about things like patient care, uh, things like emergency medical services, first responders, all these different areas, there's gonna be the potential for increased workplace violence. And then within that, we also have other tertiary risks. So in addition to violence itself, which again, ranges from verbal assault to uh, physical contact, all the way to weapons being used or worst case scenarios, there's also the potential for other exposures, things like blood or body fluids or chemicals or hazardous drugs. So there's a number of these different factors that, that may be correlated. And then of course, we know that the sources of these situations may range from coworkers, maybe employee on employee violence, maybe visitors or members of the public, clients, maybe patients, which may also have a lot of different variables, which includes things like um, neurological issues or intoxication or medication side effects. And then of course that also involves doctors or third parties and sometimes even telephone operators have been, have been verbally assaulted. So there's a lot of different factors involved there. And we'll talk about how those things relate to prevention. So a couple other things, if you notice at the bottom, we have a unique situation, of course, in the last two years that, you know, everybody's involved in is the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And because of that, that's also created a very unique atmosphere where we have seen um, a lot of stressors. We've seen a lot of situations where people are having life situations and life experiences out of the norm. And then there's also a lot of different political situations uh, across the spectrum of political science that have also increased some stressors. So within that, we wanna be able to talk about prevention so that ideally we can prevent these situations, but if we can't prevent them, then we can identify them in real time and respond to them and mitigate the risk to the lowest feasible level. So the first thing that we look at there is the guidance. Um, in this case, there was a bill passed through the House of Representatives back in April, 2021, specifically regarding healthcare workplace violence prevention. Uh, there's also a lot of guidance that comes around from OSHA and FEMA. FEMA has some really good quick reference guides regarding active shooter situations. And OSHA actually has a specific set of guidance around healthcare. And that's also an area of targeted focus. And then, of course, you know, we also want to make sure that we have good managerial commitment, we have employee engagement around the issue. So we want to make sure that everybody understands what the threats are, what the hazards are, and how to prevent and mitigate those things. And then to do that, we want to make sure we have a good workplace analysis so we know what the different possible routes of entry are, what the different threats may look like, and then what we can do about that, which takes us to our controls. Then we can train people accordingly, and then we want to make sure we keep good records so we can identify any trends, anything that may happen again. We can prevent reoccurrences, and we can learn from those situations. So those are some of the things we'll talk about today is how we can actually enact this guidance. Another thing to think about is that within the healthcare industry in particular, uh, the Joint Commission, if, if you're not familiar with the Joint Commission, it's a voluntary accreditation that a lot of healthcare organizations are with. And of course, that's a prerequisite for things like um, Medicaid for CMC compliance and whatnot, or I'm sorry, CMS compliance. Um, and Joint Commission puts out these things called Sentinel event alerts. And what that does is, it puts out a blanket message to tell everybody of what these possible threats and risks are and things to look out, look out for. And so, as you see here, they've put out this Sentinel event alert many years regarding workplace violence in healthcare. So these are ways that we can watch out for these different types of threats. You see them listed out here, and these are things that we're gonna talk about as well. So as you can see, we know that this risk is very real. We know it applies to a lot of people in a lot of industries. And we know there's areas where they have higher risks. So knowing that, we can look at the particular threats. So as we can see here, you know, we talked about we have employee on employee, we have patients that may be involved, we have visitors that may be involved, we have potential worst case scenarios, which are things like active shooters, things like very high severity mass casualty incidents. There are situations that may happen at schools. There have been situations where there have been active shooter events at schools, whether it's um, targeted toward uh, children like Cindy Hook, or whether we have situations that are targeted toward teachers or employees. Um, 
Then we also have things like telephone threats. And that may be a situation where somebody is sending the telephone threat as a precursor to arriving at the facility, or it may be something like a, like a bomb threat. So there's a lot of different variables with that. Then we also have things like verbal assault, scoldings, harassment, and sometimes those are precursors to actual violence, physical violence, I should say. Then we have other situations that are related to that where it may be things like external situations. For example, if you're in a facility and there's a situation unfolding outside in the community or in the street, that situation may affect that facility. So it may be, it may be advantageous to lock down the facility or to have a, a plan for that. So we'll talk about these things. And then of course, there's also aggressive driving and there's road rage. Um, there was a, another tragic road rage shooting here in Houston just a couple weeks ago where somebody had gone into road rage. They fired six shots into a um, adjacent vehicle on the freeway while they were in motion and the, the person wasn't able to survive that attack. And then of course, there's other situations that also apply here that are sometimes not thought about in the case of workplace violence, but things like bomb threats, or explosive materials could certainly be in that case. And there's also things that happen such as uh, crowd control situations or riots, situations where you have a lot of people involved and it may cause violence. And then you have people that may be working in that area, people that may be responding to those situations or simply people that are trying to get out of those situations. And then of course you have your weapons of mass destruction, your chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear or high explosive situations or arson. And all these things can also fit into that scenario. So ultimately what we wanna do is make sure that we have good prevention in terms of preparedness, planning, and then the ability to recognize these hazards in real time and respond to them. So we'll talk about how to do that. The first thing of course, is to put all these things into context and into perspective. So what you can see here is that it all starts with our planning. So we wanna be able to recognize what the different types of risk may be. And that's going to vary. You know, if we have a situation where it's just an office and we have the same people that work there every day, it may look different than the risks for a facility that has patients coming and going, or especially a healthcare facility where you have an ER and you have people that are coming in in need of medical attention. Or you may have a situation where you have a lot of visitors, like a, um, a public gathering or a, or a congregation like that. And so once we have those different threats assessed, then we want to make sure that we're able to put the proper preparedness in place. And that's gonna also apply to things like training. And then from there, in real time, we go into that reactive mode where we have the initial response. So if you're looking at like emergency management, that'll be your initial notification. So we wanna identify any indicators and we'll talk about what those indicators look like. Things like verbal, uh, verbal intimidation, foul language, raised voices, verbal threats. And then of course, physical intimidation, physical contact, confrontations, aggression, any of these things that may lead us to think there's a potential for violence, then we can make sure that egress routes open. We can keep reactionary distance. So we have time to identify the threat and time to, to egress. Then if it's possible, we can try to remove any potential weapons. So for example, if we're doing healthcare, we don't wanna leave uh, needles and sharps right in front of somebody that may be starting to get aggressive. So if somebody's starting to get aggressive and they're raising their voice and they're making threats, then we can try to remove those needles and sharps and we can start to find our way out of the area. So we'll talk about these things in a moment. Then of course you have your actual response and that's gonna be things like calling a code and being able to get the proper crisis response team, evacuation and all the things that apply with that up to and including run, hide, fight, which is you know evacuation, cover and concealment and if necessary, then, then and fighting back. And then from there, we can learn from those situations through things like after action reviews, and we can put in lessons or reports and we can all improve. So ideally, we'll be able to identify and prevent these things. But if we have a worst case situation, then we'll be able to learn from it. And that's what we'll talk about today is how to do that. So one of the first things we can look at as far as situational awareness is the, the ODA loop, which is OODA, the Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. And this is a really good thing that we can use to teach. They use this in the military. It started with fighter pilots in the Air Force, and then it went to the Marine Corps and then to the Army. So it's used in law enforcement now in a lot of different organizations. So it's good for situational awareness. So as you can see there, we can observe, 
for any potential threats or any potential violence. And then from there, we can orient to our location, our known, um, known response procedures, whether we can uh, create distance, hit a panic button, call for support, evacuate, whether we need to uh, try to evacuate. And if we can't, we can find a hiding place with cover and concealment. If we can't do that, then we know what we can use for weapons. Um, so these are all things that we can orient to and we can figure out the best way to respond. Then from there, we can make that decision and we can act appropriately in the right amount of time. So as we're looking at these things, we can always correlate that to the hierarchy of controls. So as you can see there, we wanna eliminate the hazards whenever possible. If we can't do that, we can substitute. If we can't do that, we can engineer. If we still can't do that, then we can provide administrative controls to lessen the exposure. And then of course we have PPE and we wanna provide training for any of those controls to make sure people know the expectations and what to do about it. And that's all gonna vary depending on what the hazard is, what the risk is and what we're doing about it. So we'll talk about some of those, some of those possibilities. So the first thing is we wanna set ourselves up for success. And that means we wanna have all the right precedents in place. So the first precedent of course with workplace violence or any threats of violence is that we wanna have a zero tolerance policy. So we don't wanna give any reason to believe it's okay to harass, threaten, or otherwise harm any of our people. So, you know, it's one of those things, it's, it's literally against the law to commit workplace violence against people. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're setting that precedent early. Then from there, we wanna have a threat assessment team. So we know what we're gonna do. We know what the hazards are. We have all the proper subject matter expertise. That also includes safety committees, because like we said, workplace violence is a hazard and it fits into the safety management system. And then from there, things like employee assistance programs are great. That way, ideally, if people are having distress, they can seek out assistance so it doesn't compound and become the kind of situation that may lead to violence. Um, and also people have the proper um, resources where if they need to get help or if they want support following any type of situation, they can do that as well. So once we have all those things in place, we wanna make sure, of course, we have a good evacuation plan the same way we would for a fire. We wanna make sure that we have life safety so that egress points are open. People know how to get out of the building. People know where to go. We have slip trip fall prevention so that we can get out safely, effectively and efficiently. And then of course, things like, like fire safety, you know, it, there's one of those situations that could cause the inability to respond. Um, if we have things like fire hazards or if we have um, chemical exposures, those things may cause a, a breakdown of the evacuation plan. So those are all prerequisites and precursors. And then of course, we wanna have good effective communication. So that's gonna be not only the communication resources, which would be things like intercoms and pager systems and phones, but also things like panic buttons and codes. So people know what it means. So for example, if you said code green, if that's your code for workplace violence, you say code green, everybody knows that they need to go ahead and get out. Um, and they're gonna be able to follow that code and know how that works. Um, and then of course, security presence is a great deterrent. And there's a lot of other means for that that we'll talk about. Then of course, things like having having locks. You know, there's a there's needs for fire safety and there's needs for security. So we wanna make sure that if people need to find a place to hide, they know where to go and they know they can lock themselves there. And then of course, surveillance also ties into security with things like um, electronic surveillance and monitoring. And then of course, just good lighting is a good precedent. We wanna make sure that we can see what's going on, especially if people are walking out to their cars in the dark. So always something to look out for to set ourselves up for success. And then once we have that, then we can start to look at the bigger picture as far as what we're gonna do about these different threats. So we have these different types of risks. And in the case of workplace violence, this may involve all of those. Strategic, meaning it may affect our ability to operate in a long-term capacity. Operational, it may affect our ability to operate day to day. External, meaning the, the risk or the threat may literally come in from the outside and we cannot control it. We can only respond to it. And then of course your hazard risk, which is part of our work and we wanna be able to recognize the hazard in real time and respond to it. And so to do that, we have to make a choice now. So do we avoid it 
meaning do we just stop doing what we're doing or do we accept it meaning well we're just going to go ahead and do our thing and if something bad happens then something bad happens or do we transfer it so in some cases you know we can transfer certain tasks or certain operations to other people who are more trained or more equipped that may be things like security there's a lot of different factors involved uh, or you can control the risk and in this case we're going to talk about some ways to control the risk of workplace violence so we can continue operations but do so in a way that's as safe as feasible so once we start to dig into that risk control in those hazard controls we have the hierarchy of controls so in terms of hazard elimination that really amounts to uh, risk avoidance that basically means that if there's a potential for workplace violence we're not going to to do the operation or the task um, so in that case it's not always feasible it's, it's not even possible to be honest um, really what that amounts to is sometimes we can try to eliminate risks if we can catch early indicators. So for example, if there's any subtle or behavioral indicators where somebody's starting to say things that are suspicious or they're starting to you know, talk about how they're fascinated with guns or they're talking about how they wanna hurt or kill somebody, then sometimes it's possible that we can do a what's considered a risk assessment. We can look into that. We can possibly do a background check. And there have been cases where it has shown up on the background check that people have a history of violence or they have warrants for their arrest or these different situations and in that case sometimes those people can be removed from that facility um, it's not a complete hazard elimination but there are cases where that has happened and of course the first step to that is identifying those indicators so if something's anything suspicious or if anybody's making threats the earlier we identify that the more we can respond to it but it's not always um, all-encompassing so that takes us to the next thing, which is something like hazard substitution. Uh, that's really only going to apply if we have specific tasks. So for example, if we have a facility and we're, we need to be able to provide security and we need to add access control, then we can transfer that to a security company that can provide that service with the proper training and the proper equipment and whatnot. Um, but in terms of everyday operations, then we're going to get more into the engineering and administrative controls. So to do that, engineering controls we can set up all of our facilities so we have good placement and egress so what i mean by that is if we have um, an office or a or a patient room in a hospital for example we don't want to set it up in a way that the employee is going to come in there and they have to go to the back left corner of the room to get on the computer and meanwhile um, the exit the egress from the room has been blocked by somebody else so they're effectively trapped in that room so we always want to set it up so that we can get out of the room we don't want to get trapped in there so whenever we set up any operations we want to make sure that nothing's blocking the exit and then of course some facilities have metal detectors uh, it's not a absolute control but it's a it's a supplement there and then of course panic buttons are a great thing that way if there's support needed such as security then you can hit the panic button very quickly and in the process of egressing as soon as the hazard identified so if somebody starts making threats, we can create distance, we can hit the panic button, and we can find our way out of the room because the exit point is open. Um, we want to make sure we have good lighting so that there's nothing happening literally in the dark. And we want to make sure that if we have to have hiding places, we know where they are, how to get there, and we know they can provide cover and concealment. Cover meaning it'll stop a projectile. Concealment meaning that we can't be seen. So ideally, a good hiding place would be both those things. So if I'm working in an area, if somebody comes in the door making threats and I can't evacuate, then I know where I can hide, where it's going to block a projectile and stop them from seeing me. If it doesn't provide cover, then it can at least provide concealment. Um, so if we identify those areas early, then people know what they can do if there's an immediate hazardous threat. And then from that point, then we have our administrative controls. Okay, so at this point, let's, let's say that we have a situation where um, there weren't any early indicators. So it wasn't an opportunity to do a background check or a risk assessment on that, that person or that threat. Um, then we have a situation where we're doing our operations. So we have patient care going on, we have public services going on, uh, 
and then somebody comes in, there's no indicators, they start making threats. Okay, so now we know we can identify the threat. We can hit the panic button to call for support. We have security that can show up. We have the egress point open. We can start finding our way out. And then other things we can do there, um, like we said, we have security. Then there's also um, some organizations have canine programs. Canine programs have their own capabilities. Um, access control is a good thing. So if we have a situation where there's a, um, a potential threat outside, we can do access control so that we know there's only one point of entry and we know everybody who's coming through that point of entry. Um, so we don't have uncontrolled access to the facility. We can have electronic surveillance, uh, physical security. And then of course, we wanna make sure we have good situational awareness so that we can identify those threats. And that's gonna be where that, that or observe, orient, decide, and act comes into place. And then if we identify those threats, then we can try to de-escalate if possible. And there's a lot to be said about de-escalation. Just if you're doing healthcare, for example, things like um, using calming tones and not reaching across the person when they're in the patient bed, um, again, keeping any potential weapons out of reach, um, things that we can do to try to make the situation better so we don't put ourselves in, in the line of fire or in harm's way. If that's if that's not possible, if the situation has already escalated, if there's an immediate threat, then we can call a code. Like we said, we wanna make sure everybody knows what those codes mean so they can respond appropriately. And then from there, they wanna know the procedures for that code. So that means what are we gonna do as far as how do we call for support? How do we evacuate the building? How do we call for evacuation? Um, do we pull the fire alarm? Do we hit a panic button? You know, We have to have a procedure for these things. And then from there, we can create reactionary distance. So sometimes it's just a matter of keeping distance and watching for any threats. Sometimes it's a matter of it's immediately dangerous and we need to go ahead and leave. And that way we wanna make sure we know that the exit's open and we can get out effectively and efficiently. Um, if we can't get out, then we can hide. And like we said, we wanna predetermine where those hiding areas are, preferably with cover and concealment. And then last resort is the fight, which means that we have to basically uh, fight an assailant to, to get out safely or as safely as possible. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But some other things there, um, if there's a situation with arson or with a fire involved, then fire suppression may be a factor. Um, in the case of um, an incipient fire, sometimes you can use a fire extinguisher, otherwise it's an evacuation. And then of course, if there's any hazmat involved, then that may be a whole different discussion of things like contamination control zones, um, cutting off the HVAC, blocking air entry into the room or in the facility, uh, PPE, respirators, decontamination. So there's, there's a whole different thing about hazmat and seaburn response. But if that's a situation, the most important thing is being able to get away from the hazard and call on the appropriate people that can respond to that. And that's where we get into the things like risk transfer is people that have the right equipment and the right knowledge and procedures. Then something to think about there is that within any of this, there's always something to be said for distance. So for example, we know that if there's a potential disease exposure, we keep distance so that we can prevent the exposure. Um, same thing with workplace violence. If we identify a threat, the first and foremost thing is that we want to create distance so it gives us more time to recognize the threat, more time to check if there's any weapons or anything imminently dangerous, more time to call for support, and then if we need to, we can evacuate and we're that much closer to the door. So distance is always a good thing. It works for disease exposure, it works for workplace violence, it, it works for motor vehicle collision prevention as well. D distance is a good thing. It's our friend. And then, of course, if we're talking about responders, or if we're talking about special situations, we may have a need for PPE. So if we have people that are responding to things like workplace violence, then there may be a need for things like um, head protection, eye protection, um, ballistic plates, Kevlar, respiratory protection, if there's um, things like riot control agents involved. And again, that's a whole different discussion, but um, the thing about PPE is that unless we know that there's a threat and we know that we're purposefully entering the area where the threat is, PPE is not always a, an accessible thing. So if we look at this in real time, this kind of breaks it down. So you can see here, for example, if we have somebody that enters a facility, this is written for a, for a hospital. Um, 
we have our security deterrent in that area. We have our people that are working. If somebody becomes combative, then we can immediately recognize that situation. And then from there, if the person's in a room, then we wanna make sure that as soon as we recognize that hazard or that threat, we wanna keep the reactionary distance. We can try to deescalate. We can try to remove any weapons. We make sure we don't have anything blocking the exit. And then from there, if that person becomes violent, ideally we can just go ahead and leave the situation. But if that's not possible, then we can hit a panic button. We can call for security or assistance. And then the last resort, of course, is that if we have to defend ourselves, then we have those different procedures to do that. And that may be things like blocking a punch, blocking a strike, blocking a kick. Um, there's a lot of different training for that, but um, that's always gonna be a last resort. So ideally, we can identify the threat, create distance, call for support, whether it's a panic button or whatnot, call for a code, and then we can evacuate. Um, if we can't do that, then of course we can call for assistance. And if we're absolutely stuck, then we can use those reactionary techniques. But there's a couple of factors with that that we'll talk about in a moment. So a couple other things to think about there. Um, if there's a situation in the community, like we said, there may be a need to, to lock down the facility. So for example, if you have people that are working and you have a situation that's unfolding outside, we don't want that situation to come into the area. So it may be a time to lock down the facility, maybe a time to implement access control, uh, maybe a time to get people out of uh, line of sight. And then if we have a situation where we're in the field, so if we have like a, um, a community service or if we have people that are on a, on a field location, sometimes there's not a facility to fall back to. So sometimes it's a situation where um, we want to make sure we have a security presence because if there becomes a workplace violence threat, there's not an area to go into. And egress just simply means trying to find a car to get out of the situation. But um, there's a couple variables there if we're in the, in the community or in the field. Um, then of course we have situations where there's external threats. So if we have a public area, um, if you have a situation where it may come into the building or if somebody calls in the threat on a telephone, then that's a matter of number one, of course, um, if we can, we can evacuate the facility. If we can't do that, then we can figure out what the person's saying on the phone and whether there's a, whether there's a reasonable threat. We can implement access control so we know who's coming in the facility from that point on. We can keep people out of the line of sight so that people can't see where the people are in the facility. And then if we have to, um, we can, we can call, for, call for support from security or law enforcement. Um, but the idea there is to recognize the threat and be able to understand um, what the potential outcome may be. And then of course, if we have things like explosive threats, which would be things like bomb threats, then um, if it's an actual bomb, then of course we can, we can evacuate the facility. Um, if we have something like a telephone threat, then we wanna capture the information and then we want to make sure that we're able to communicate that to the appropriate people, whether it's a supervisor or, or law enforcement. Um, and then, of course, if it's a bomb threat, we want to make sure we don't use a cell phone because, of course, that may, that may trigger an explosive device. Um, and then from that point, of course, the, the evacuation is going to be just like you would for a, for a fire. So from this point, as you can see there, we've talked about making sure that um, we identify as many indicators as early as possible. Um, if there's an opportunity to do a background check or a risk assessment, we can do that for a particular threat. We wanna make sure the rooms are set up for proper egress. We wanna make sure that we have good evacuation plans. We have communication, people are trained. And then from there, we wanna make sure that we can identify those threats in real time. If we have to, um, if we catch a threat, we can, create distance, we can hit a panic button, we can evacuate. If we can't do that, then we can find a place to hide with cover and concealment. If we can't do that, then we can, um, we can prepare to have, to have to fight back. And that's where we get to this point. So as you can see there, there's that unique area where there's the potential that we would have to do self-defense. Um, so a couple of factors about that. Um, like we said, first and foremost, we wanna evacuate. We wanna get out of the situation. If we can't do that, then we wanna hide. And that's where we have cover and concealment. We wanna stop, we don't want any visibility. 
We want to have locks so they can't get into us. And then if we have to fight back, then we can get, like we said, makeshift weapons. So we can find things like, uh, like using a fire extinguisher or, or a pair of scissors. And that's only going to apply if we're in actual imminent danger and there's no other alternatives. Um, and then once we get out of the situation, then of course, when the responders show up, like law enforcement, we want to make sure that we're able to show our hands so that we don't get mistaken for the threat itself. And we want to definitely follow their directions. So when these things are happening, um, like we said, that's an absolute last resort is that self-defense is the kind of thing that we only want to resort to if the other alternative is, is getting hurt or killed. Um, so the intention is preservation of life. Um, in the healthcare environment, there's always the factor that, you know, there's the, the oath, do no harm. So we don't want to have a situation where um, somebody's being harmed, especially if there's not a dire need for that. Um, so self-defense is one of those things that has implications. So for example, there's optics involved. Uh, there's potential media coverage. There's even potential litigation. So at all times, we want to be able to identify the hazard, create distance, call for support, and get out of the situation. If we can't do that, then we can we can hide. But um, the the self defense and the the uh, real time reactionary techniques are definitely a last resort there. And so from that point, um, if that has to happen, then of course that we can do that. Um, with as much mitigation as possible. Uh, so then the last part of this equation, of course, is the response. So once this thing is done, then we have a situation where there's a potential that there'll be casualties. Um, there's even the potential for mass casualties. So we wanna be able to watch for these things so that we can provide as much care as possible. And that's what I was talking about earlier, where if we have a situation where there's not enough medics, there's not enough supplies, then there's a need for first aid CPR training. There's a need for ADs. There's a need for stop the bleed kits, trauma kits, things like tourniquets. So of course there's different levels of training for that. You have everything from your basic first aid, AED and CPR training to things like basic life support all the way to your EMT levels, your paramedic, and then of course your nursing levels uh, all the way up to MD. You know, So there's an, a lot of different levels of training um, so just having people that know how to identify these types of injuries is a really good thing. And from there, with first aid kits, um, ANSI has your class A and your class B first aid kits. So of course, a class A kit's going to be very general in nature. A class B kit's going to have a little more trauma supplies, things like a tourniquet and pressure bandages. We want to make sure we have ADs. And then we want to make sure that when we go to do the CPR, that we're able to do that initial assessment so we know who needs the CPR. So we want to check for the airway, breathing, and circulation. So if somebody needs CPR and they're not breathing, there's no circulation, then we can do that. Um, and we want to make sure we have the proper training to do that. So within that, we have our triage. Um, if we have a situation like an active shooter situation, then it's important that we do that triage because there are certain factors involved with that. We want to check for things that are life-threatening, things like um, hemorrhagic bleeding, ABCs, airway breathing circulation, um, if there's any damage to the head, neck, or spine. But then we want to do that in a context to where we can take what's needed, take care of what's needed first uh, in terms of priority. So for example, the, you know, the, the most commonly used example, like in the military, is if you have somebody that's wounded in a, in, in a gunfight, then the bullets are going to kill them before the spinal injury. So you want to get them out of the way of the bullets, and then you can treat the injuries. Um, so the triage is very important there. So you want to check to see who needs help, what kind of help they need, and then we want to get them out of immediate danger and then take care of them appropriately. But we want to make sure we have the proper certification to do that. Um, and that's what protects us with the Good Samaritan Act. So for example, the Good Samaritan Act says that we have to have the proper training to do it, the proper certification. We can only operate within our certification. We have to have uh, no intention of compensation and we have to have good faith, meaning that we're not gonna hurt anybody. So again, do no harm. So if we have the proper intentions, the proper training, and we're taking care of people, then that falls under the Good Samaritan Act, which is very important there. Um, and then the last part of that, of course, is to stop the bleed kits, which are a supplement to first aid kits, 
and they provide trauma supplies with things like tourniquets if there's a need for that. So what you can see here is this shows um, some of the things that are in those ANSI certified class A and class B kits. As you can see there, the class B kit has more of the trauma supplies. So those are good things to have. So at this point now, we talked about prevention. We talked about the immediate response, both the evacuation, the response, the support, and then the first aid. And then now at this point, we wanna learn from these situations. So we wanna be able to have a good reporting process. We can take that information, we can transfer it to the threat assessment team, safety committees, people that are involved. Sometimes these things, uh, a lot of times these things are in a NIMS or a National Incident Management System or Incident Command System structure. So if there's a situation that's pretty severe, there are gonna be things like reunification centers, um, they'll do things like critical incident stress debriefings, which are great for psychological first aid and uh, mental wellness. And then, of course, most organizations have an employee assistance program. Those things, again, those are good for if somebody needs help proactively. Sometimes those things can prevent a potential workplace violence situation. Or, of course, reactively, as if there is a situation, then the EAP can certainly help with things like therapy. So the last thing I was gonna say here today is, if we look at all this in the strategic context, so aside from just the immediate prevention and response, if we look at this in terms of the big picture, like we said, we wanna make sure we have the policies. We wanna make sure we're providing training and education, the facilities controls with things like setting up the areas for proper egress, having an evacuation plan, having panic buttons, um, having proper security, having people that are trained in the different codes and they know what to do. We wanna make sure that's all in our plan. We wanna make sure we're promoting good situational awareness. And then we, we can do things like exercises and walkthroughs. So it's a good way to walk through these things so people can say, they can see it. Okay, if there's a threat coming in this area, then what do I do next? Well, I can evacuate out this area. Well, if I can't do that, then I can hide in this place with cover and concealment. If I can't do that, then I can use this to fight back if I absolutely have to. Um, and then once the situation is over, who's trained in CPR, who's trained in first aid, where are the first aid kits, where are the stop the bleed kits, then we can walk through those steps. So exercises are a good thing and it, we can have checklists for that. So that can help us to catch all of those different variables. And we want to do all that with transparency so people don't feel like they're being placed in a situation that's potentially unsafe and they're in doubt of what to do. So if we walk through all of this, then they know, okay, here's where we can look for threats. If we see a threat, we create distance. We hit the panic button. We call for security. We egress through this area. We make sure that area is not blocked. If we need a hiding place, we go into here where they can't see you and they can't shoot at you. If we have to fight back, then you can use this thing to do that. Um, and if, if you're providing CPR, here's the first aid kit. Here's the AED. Here's the trauma supplies. So we can go through all of these things and people know exactly what to expect. It's always a good thing for transparency. And then ultimately that goes into the continual improvement cycle, safety management system. So again, we check in for having the proper input with our safety committees and our threat assessment teams. We're putting those controls in place. We're communicating those expectations. We're validating these things with leading indicators. So we're checking for inspections for the facility. We're checking for observations for work practices. And then we're following up on any situations that may happen. And ultimately these things create that high reliability culture. So by doing these things, we're ultimately gonna be preoccupied with failure. So we're watching for these potential situations. We're deferring to experts so we can get the right input. We're not simplifying it. So we're making sure we have multiple layers of prevention and response. We're making sure these things can be done within our operations. And then we're, we're committed to resilience. So we can make sure that we can learn from these things and we can continually improve so ideally we can prevent everything possible and then mitigate the rest. And then like we said, that all fits into this cycle. So we wanna make sure that we're covering all the angles because if we don't have the planning and preparedness, then we're not ready for a response. If we don't watch for indicators, then we're not gonna be able to respond in real time. If we go to respond and we don't have training, we don't know what to do. If we do a response and we can't run or hide, 
people have to know how they can defend themselves. And then we want to learn from those things with our after action reviews. So we want to learn from all these things and get better. And ultimately, this all falls into basic culture change. You know, if we have people that are definitely safe, those are the people that can help us. Those are the people that can help us with plans and with preparedness and with recommendations. And those are the people that are watching for indicators. If we have uh, people that are defiantly unsafe, you know, they're not following the protocols or they're making threats or they're, um, they're, they're contributing to the potential risk, then that's where we want to catch those things early so we can respond to them and we can try to mitigate that risk. And ultimately, that's what keeps us safe is identifying where those risks are and how they manifest. And then, of course, that all goes into this overall big picture. So we can get from potentially unsafe situations to the high reliability culture by doing those different steps, the hazard analysis, the controls, the communication, the leading indicators, the lagging indicators, and the follow-up. So if we do all those things, then those steps allow us to catch where there's potential risks and mitigate them in, in real time, in the long term. And then ultimately what that does is it allows us to catch as much as we can when it's high frequency, low severity. So if we have those things like verbal threats or um, you know, low intensity threats, we can catch all those things and it lessens the ability for it to increase up to a higher severity. Because ultimately, if we don't catch it at the employee level, which you can see on the far right here, then it may escalate to a campus or a visitor or public safety issue. If we still don't catch it, it may go up the ladder even more. Uh, infection control wouldn't really apply to this, but um, then it goes up to the full-on emergency management level where it requires NIMS and ICS and a full-on response. And at that level, it becomes very low frequency, but very high severity, meaning it can actually shut down the organization and end up on the news and have a very tragic outcome. So ultimately, they want to catch everything when it's very high frequency, but low severity. And we can do that through those response um, preparedness planning and response procedures. But um, if, if anybody would like to talk offline or we have uh, checklists, articles, all different kinds of resources about this type of thing. If you're interested in any of that, feel free to let me know. I'm always happy to help. Um, this is my, my contact information. And um, again, I apologize for the hiccup earlier, kind of took about seven, eight minutes out of our time, <laughs> but uh, thank you all. Great, thanks, Corey. We appreciate you sharing your insights with us today. Just a reminder for our attendees, uh, you can ask a question by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type in your question and hit the send button. We might not get to every question today, but the good news is, all of the unanswered questions will be forwarded along to Corey. Uh, I wanna let everyone know about the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen after this webinar. Your input is important to us because it does help us to improve our, improve our future webcasts. So Corey, let's get to a couple questions here. One of our audience members would like to know, you mentioned the OODA loop, the ODA loop that you mentioned. Um, and she asks, is there um, a, a online resource where she can learn more about that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the, um, well, two things. Uh, first, of course, I can, I can send information if you'd like. I, that's part of my dissertation, and I have a lot of stuff on it. But if you'd like the source of it, it came from um, Colonel John Boyd from the Air Force, and it was in his briefing called Patterns of Conflict, and it can be found on Google. You know, feel free to just type in John Boyd Patterns of Conflict or John Boyd Oda Loop, and you'll find all kinds of stuff on there from all different areas. And um, certainly the, the initial source, but also a lot of application over the years in um, uh, law enforcement, military, all different contexts. Great. We thank you for that, Corey. Um, next question here is, you know, you talked about uh, COVID-19 and how that kind of became an emerging issue in the workplace. When it comes to workplace violence, are there other emerging issues that you um, that you notice or that folks in the safety field are noticing right now? Yes, um, absolutely. The, the the things that we've noticed in the the last two years, in particular, of course, is you, you have the pandemic, and within the pandemic, of course, there's um, there's the need for disease exposure prevention, but in addition to that, you have a enormous variance in perspectives and opinions about that situation. 
and that's that's led to a lot of kind of volatility that you can see i mean just in a cursory look of social media um i looked at it the other day and i, I mean i counted like 15 different situations where people were threatening to hurt somebody else it's 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 scary that it's kind of getting at a higher level like that and because of that that tells us that we we just need to look for these types of risk and threats and be prepared to to mitigate them so unfortunately that's a big thing um and that all ties in of course to the pandemic and um a lot of things that are happening in the world these days Great. Well, thank you for that response, Corey. Our, our next question is, have you seen workplace violence situations where these prevention and response methods were successful? And could you share maybe an example of those? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I can give two examples uh, at, at different, different severity levels. Uh, the first example is that uh, there was a situation where somebody had gotten irritated about some things and they called a clinic and they said, I'm going to come to the clinic and shoot everybody. And because of that, uh, it wasn't possible to evacuate the facility. So they locked down the facility. They implemented access control. So security was checking everybody who came in. And then from there, they could move people out of the line of sight from the outside windows. They could prepare if they have to evacuate out the back door. And they were able to get security there as a deterrent and as a support. Um, and that way they were able to monitor that situation. And then at the same time, they reported it to law enforcement and they were able to investigate and follow up on the phone threat. So everything got resolved in, in relatively quick time. Um, another situation that's a little higher severity is at a, at a different clinic, there was a situation where somebody came in and they, they got irritated about something. Um, they made a verbal threat and then they showed that they were they were carrying a weapon. And in that case, just like we talked about, um, the team was able to create immediate distance. They were able to communicate that this person has a weapon. Somebody hit the panic button. Security was able to come and help. They were able to call law enforcement. Um, the person, thankfully, actually went ahead and left the building. Um, they didn't, after they made the threat and the situation started to escalate, they, they left on their own accord. When law enforcement came, they arrested the person. Um, and then incidentally, they did a check and it turned out the person was actually had a, had a warrant and they weren't, they were a felon. They weren't supposed to be carrying a weapon anyway. So that situation got resolved. But thankfully, in the immediate response, the team was able to recognize the threat, create distance, hit the panic button, call for support, and prepare to evacuate if they needed to. And that that prevented safety, or excuse me, that enabled safety for the team and also for the all the clients that were in the clinic at that time. Great. Well, Corey, we looks like we've got time for one more question today before we uh, wrap up here. And the question is, what factors do you look for in a workplace violence risk or threat assessment? Yes. Um, the the big things, number one, of course, are the you know the potential vulnerabilities to the team. So, like we said, is are we dealing with um, are we dealing with the public or are we dealing with patients? Um, do we have a lot of accessibility? So for example, do we have a, do we have a finite amount of entries or are we in the, in the middle of a parking lot, you know, with, with complete 360 access to the team? Um, have we had any known threats? Um, do we have any situations where there's any kind of volatility? Um, and then from there, do we have the proper uh, precedence? Do we have everything from the policy to the evacuation plan to the communication to the panic buttons? Are people trained in first aid and CPR? Um, do they know where the evacuations are, the egress points are? And then from there, um, as we work, you know, we'll just real time monitor for those threats and then be able to respond as necessary. But um, yeah, all those, all those precedents and all those planning points, those are all the things that we look for to make sure that we're as prepared as possible. And then we'll check to see what the vulnerability and accessibility is to potential threats and whether we're able to respond to that. Uh, and that tells us what those different risk levels look like. Great. Well, thank you, Corey. Folks, we have run out of time today for today's presentation. We thank you all for attending. Uh, a special thank you goes out to our terrific presenter, Corey Worden, and everyone from our sponsor at Aveta. This ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. Take care, everyone and have a safe day.